Yannick is such a huge figure now in classical music, in opera all around the world. His rise in the music has been phenomenal. He's been conducting since he was 10 years old. He's gone on to be the music director for Montreal's Orchestre Metropolitan for the Philadelphia Orchestra, as I mentioned. And in 2018, he became the music director of New York's Metropolitan Opera, only the third in the institution's history. As gigs go, it doesn't really get much bigger than that. Did I also mention he's up for three Grammys this year? And again, is Canadian. I'm so pleased to say to talk about his illustrious career. Yannick Nezet Seguin joins me now from Philadelphia. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. You are just out of rehearsal? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in Philadelphia, with the Philadelphia Orchestra, for an other al- album, actually, we're recording live this uh, this week. And it's not Florence Price this time, although we did play some Florence Price a couple of days ago again. But we're recording also some Rachmaninoff, uh, which was very closely associated with the orchestra. And we're back in the old Academy of Music where Rachmaninoff stood up and conducted this orchestra uh, about 100 years ago. And um, that's that's really, uh, uh, yeah, that's, you know, my life is a, is a fairy tale, even under the circumstances that we all know in the world at the moment, I think we're just fighting for music to be heard, and that feels great. Uh, rehearsal went well? Yeah, rehearsal is going good, and yeah, it's such a fantastic orchestra there that's, uh, I don't know, the spirit of making music is so good, and we hear it in, I think, their delivery of music, and hopefully we hear it also in the, the albums, like this Forest Price one. How do you feel now, these days, when you're on the podium? <laughs> you know, I have three families now, my Montreal family, my New York family and my Philly family. And I don't get to travel as much as I used to. I don't get to to guest conduct. You know, I, I go once in a while to Europe and but I used to travel the world, you know, every week in a different continent. And it was fun when it, while it lasted. But I think we make better music when we know each other. So I, I feel good that just going back from one of my groups to the other and all this this trio or this trinity, however you want to call it, it just feels like the, the, the right partnership for me to express all my various, um, the various sides of my, uh, what I want to say in music. Can you tell me the first time you conducted an orchestra? Yeah. Yeah. Very clear. Um. I have this memory of uh, doing the Brahms Tragic Overture with a big pickup orchestra with very good people that, because I was a conductor of a choir and then wanted to do a a work for choir and orchestra. So we assembled an orchestra of, I don't know, 60, 70 piece. And I was 21 at the time. And I, uh, I stood in front and conducted this 12 minute piece, the Brahms Tragic Overture. And after those 12 minutes, I just had no back left. I had no arms left. I had no shoulders left. I had no water in my body left because I was sweating so much. Um, but I remember, and it's still, I, I loved it. I knew this is what I wanted to do. You know, I, I have this clear memory and I have a, a collection of memories of when I conducted orchestras the first time. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, it is to treasure, of course, because now it's about 25 years ago that I started. I love that you were tired, like an, <laughs> like an athlete. You were tired. Yeah. yeah, it's very physical to conduct. Yeah, it is yeah. physical. Yeah, every time I've every time I've, I've played in an orchestra or like a, a concert band or something like that, I would often notice that at the end, the the maestro or the conductor, a lot of sweat. Like it's 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 you know it's real deal. Yeah, we have to, uh, the way I see it is that I need as a conductor to express physically what I think about the music and to embody the music. And I don't want to be restrained or restricted with my gestures. So that's why I'm also taking care of my body and taking care of what I eat a bit like an athlete and working out. So I want to feel free on, on the podium, not to get injured and uh, I used to be much more animated than I am now. And I still, I think, much more animated than I will become when I'm 80, hopefully. Uh, but that's okay. I I, I never uh, want to uh, put myself in a, in a situation where I feel like, oh, I need to do less. I think I, I just want to express freely. I want to play you a piece of music right now that I know is part of your story. Take a listen to this. Thank you. 
Any idea what that is? <laughs> the great Tchaikovsky Pathétique. Yeah, this is the, the Zubin Mehta recording. Oh, okay. Yes, that is... Oh, well, then I understand why you decided to put this on. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, that's, that's my very first orchestral concert I ever attended. Um, I asked my parents to buy... Uh, meet uh, a ticket to go and see the Montreal Symphony in concert. I was, I must have been, I don't know, nine years old, something like this, eight or nine. And uh, Zubin Mehta was guest conducting the Montreal Symphony in Tchaikovsky Pathétique. So that made the, the, obviously the strongest and most inspiring impression because, you know, I'm still here and conducted that piece, that very piece for many important debuts for me. Uh, that was part of my first program when I was named at the Orchestre Metropolitain in 2000. That was part of, that was my debut with the Philadelphia Orchestra was with that piece. I recorded it also for Dutch gramophone. So yeah, it's been a very important piece. Uh, I guess probably in part, uh, in large part because of that uh, first encounter with the piece when I was so young. So what kind of nine-year-old drags his parents to go see Tchaikovsky? <laughs> A weirdo, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think I was interested in music, but I was interested in many, many, many things at the time. You know, my, my parents were good at just introducing us to many things, theater, sports, um, um, dance, and music of many genres. And it, of course, there was a piano at home, and yes, my parents would play once in a while, and my 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 sisters were um, uh, learning piano, and I was a little bit, but it was not like oh, I'm I want to be a musician up to that point. But then I think it's important for me to say that in the media there was a lot of coverage on the Montreal Symphony because they were going on tour. And those were the times where with Charles Dutois, were, those were the golden years of the Montreal Symphony yeah. going all across Europe. And I could see as a kid that it was on the newspaper and on the news and on television. And I want to stress how important it is for the media to be able to talk about, uh, well, classical music and other form of performing arts like this, because this is how. I got interested. It, I just felt it fascinating. So I wanted to go and see what it is. And uh, the rest is history. So that, that's how. But even then, not everyone who, not everyone who's nine drags their parents to classical music. And you explained that. That's great. Not everybody who's around that age wants to conduct. You were like 10 when you conducted? Yeah. So <laughs> I guess what, what attracted me at the time was the, uh, the, the choreographic aspect of it. You know, I, I could see that it, it was something that went with the music. I found it cool. I found it fun also to imagine that my uh, making music and my, my um, profession would be something where I would always be surrounded by a lot of people. And I guess that played into a certain kind of leadership quality that I had, although I was not conscious of that at the time. Uh, I, I remember thinking of oh, piano. I love it, but it's so lonely. Uh, I want to be, be with other people, but I want to have my own place within the group. And this is, uh, this is what a conductor does. You know, I, I'm still one musician making music with the others, but my responsibility is to uh, guide the other people so still lead but be part of something bigger was was the, did you have a role model did you have someone you looked up to in that i role? mean not really in the in the uh, children in my uh, my childhood years but soon after this i started to uh, collect a lot of cds i uh, everything every money i was making for the little jobs i was doing you know i would my pocket money, so to speak, I would spend on recordings. I would go to the record store once a week, at least downtown Montreal and buy as many to discover the repertoire. And so quickly, I had a favorite one who was called this Italian maestro called Carlo Maria Giulini. And he was making a lot of recordings at the time. Of, and, of what? Uh, like what, kind of, what kind of stuff was he conducting? 
Yeah, I mean, but this this symphony we just heard of Tchaikovsky, but he was doing some Verdi, some opera, also some some Beethoven, also some Brahms, which is my favorite composer. So um, I, I I got really uh, Giulini recordings were the best for me, and I dreamt of of meeting him, but I. Um, at the end, you know, I, I just thought I'm too young and he's too old. <laughs> we'll never get to meet. But later, fast forward at age around, I, I think was also at age 21 or 22. I wrote him a letter, decided it's a little bit like sending a bottle, you know, like throwing a bottle in the, the, in the sea, in the yeah. ocean. Yeah. And, and actually it worked. He did call back and we ended up meeting in Milan and I could follow him and have private sessions with him during a year and observe him and uh, his rehearsals. And that was, of course, invaluable. That's a beautiful thing. That's a, I mean, not everyone gets to have that experience, you know. No, I, I feel very lucky. And it's an interesting thing with conductors, too, because I don't think I fully, because to me, when I was growing up in Newfoundland, you know, conductors were the person who kept tempo for me. And I had a couple of great ones, you know, who taught me about, you know, expression and, and helped me, you know, yeah. and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't until I got into... Beethoven 7 in a really mm. heavy way, which I think is a pretty big gateway or a symphony, right? Like it's, it's, it's Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think this, this is beautiful. This is one of those where it's unique. I think at any age or any background, if you hear that music, it's like, wow, that's special. So I loved it. And one of my friends is an orchestral timpanist. And he said to me, like, yeah, you like it? Like, so what do you like? Do you like this recording of it or that recording of it or that recording of it? And I went like, well, I don't know. I just like the symphony. And he said, no, 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 no. He said like in the nicest way possible. He said, you need to listen to these different three conductors do it because you are going to hear the, the orchestra play it completely differently. You're going to hear this piece of music that you love completely differently every time. And that was lost on me. I'm sure it's lost on a, on a lot of people. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the the reason why maybe is lost, but then if you put them back to back, then it's like, oh, yeah, why uh, why is it so different? You know, and I think this, you're touching part of what I'm passionate about with classical music is that many people think that it's not for them if they don't know so much about it. And I feel like it shouldn't be different like going to the movies. You know, it shouldn't be different than... You go to the movies and you like a movie or you don't like. You like the story, you like the acting. But I, I, I make an opinion whenever I see a film, but I'm not equipped. I never studied in film. I don't know what true lighting is. I don't know what editing is, you know, but I, I still form an opinion. And I feel that, unfortunately, in classical music, for many reasons, uh, reasons in part due to some of what classical musicians have been projecting over the years, is that you can appreciate a concert only if you're knowledgeable. Yeah. And I disagree with that. I think you know you can go and, and sit there and be immersed by the emotion of being there because there's a lot of sound or because it's very quiet, because you look at the instruments being made. It's it's all human people, you know, uh, through blood and sweat doing the music and no computers and no amplification. But of course, if you're knowledgeable about it, then you're going to be able to analyze it more. And I that's my passion. I want everyone to feel welcome to concerts and then discover uh, uh, later. It's also so mindful. Like it's the opposite of scrolling my phone do you know what i mean <laughs> like like i feel like i can i feel like i'm, I'm i so I, I do I'm, i meditate a fair bit right you know and I, I sit down and I, i'll meditate for like 20 minutes at a time and part of the reason it feels so good part of the reason it feels so good is because i'm giving myself to something for a long time and i, I started to get that way with symphonic music too you know yeah. So I, I love what you're saying because it's also something that's been, I think, a mistake at some point because everything becomes so fast paced, you know, and then on your phone and every clip, you know, it feels like even songs, quite frankly, pop songs, they used to be five minutes long. They became four minutes. Now it's like two and a half. And that's like the average thing that goes on radio and commercial radio. And I mean, nothing against it, but then, I think that instead of trying to make classical music adapt to this, saying, oh, it needs to be fast-paced, no. I think as human nature, we do need to meditate. Everybody wants to do some yoga. Everybody goes to have massage or a spa or retreat or whatever it is. 
classical music gives you that plus the bonus of being moved by it, being challenged by it, being, but this is where you can forget about it and forget that time exists and it's very precious. And I do believe that increasingly uh, human nature will realize that they need that and classical music will be still be there for them. Yeah. It is. Maybe it just needs a, a new branding. Yeah. Yeah. And not to be apologetic for the length. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me reintroduce you here. My, my guest is Yannick Nezes again, the acclaimed Canadian conductor. Um, I mean, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, I mean, in 2018, you took over at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, a massive deal, a massive story for a lot of reasons, but a massive story. I'll, I'll ask it broadly. What was that time like for you? That's been a dream, of course, come true to get to this house. You know, the, um, I first guest conducted there in 2009. And up to that point, my operatic uh, experience, which started in Montreal, and then I guessed it also in Toronto and in Vancouver and Hamilton also, and then in the States. And of course, I always wanted to be at the Met Um to guest conduct and then regularly it was i think a very organic development which is every season going to guest conduct once a year and then get to meet more people get to know the orchestra better know the chorus know the culture of the house but then boom happens this uh offer which i accepted in 2016 to become the music director um i knew it was huge and i tried because op- opera is so planned so much in advance and I was so busy I I said okay I'm gonna say yes but it's gonna start only in three or four years but then circumstances happened that I needed to step up a bit earlier yeah and um you know it, yes it's a big deal but I also yes I I, I got a lot of <laughs> fear and anxiety about it but what helped me solve this or at least be uh, comfortable with it is to remember that since I'm 18 years old, I'm kind of a music director or artistic director. It started with uh, amateur choirs, but there was still, you know, a season to plan, a budget to to make, uh, personnel to manage, um, uh, a board to please, uh, all of this. And then I founded my own ensemble, La Chapelle de Montréal, when I was 20, and then became music director in Montreal and so forth. So it's just all of this, but bigger, to a bigger scale in, in, at the Met. So that's how I, <laughs> I, I uh, conditioned myself to, uh, to, 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 be, uh, uh, to handle all those challenges. Well, let, me, let me ask you then what I asked you earlier. Do you remember, or can you tell me the moment where you walked on the podium for the first time as, I'm not as guest, as the guy at the, yeah. at the Met? Well, I, I do have a, a few memories. The first is as a guest, but it's because it was with the opera Carmen. And it starts with this overture with, you know, it's maybe close second to uh, to be, well, or maybe in the, uh, the top five yeah. most famous classical pieces. And I started the overture at such a breakneck speed. <laughs> yeah. And they went with me. They went for it. And yeah. I was just, it was a thrill. It was a thrilling moment. And I remember I was kind of half conscious of what I was doing. I think I was also, my my heart was probably beating very fast. So this is why it was a bit faster than I thought. But I also wanted it to be faster than usual to make kind of a statement. So I, I remember that. Um, it did not, there was no car crash, it, it worked, but it was still breakneck. Um, and then fast forward, I, I do have the memory of um, my first production that when I went back to the theater after it had been uh, announced that I would become music director was Flying Dutchman by Wagner. And at the end of the Dutchman, I went out to take my solo bow on stage and the orchestra had prepared to have each and every one a rose that they were holding. And they all threw from the pit the roses on me uh-huh. uh, on the stage. Uh, I, I still get teary-eyed uh, when I, I think about it. You know, that's, uh, for me, it's all about the relationship and the, 
connection with the musicians, if I can call it love. Of course, it will never be like love. Um, like it, it can be friendship, but, you know, I can't be friends, you know, like oh, having dinner and stuff like this. But I think it's a friendly relationship that the conductor needs to have with the musicians in order for music to be re resonate with all its truth. Is, is it a lonely life, conductor? Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is because um, at the end of the day, even if you're surrounded by a lot of people, um, I'm still alone on my podium, need to make decisions all the time. And also, you know, if you're a violinist, if you're a pianist, if you're a uh, whatever instrument, when you're making music or practicing at home, working on your the pieces and getting ready, there's a dialogue with the sound. As a conductor, uh, when I study my scores, I study it in silence. So I'm not only alone with my score, but I'm alone with in silence. So, but I like this contrast though. It's really lonely, but then when it, I get to do my thing, it's it's almost chaos. Especially, you know, when uh, when it's an opera house where there's a hundred chorus members and then a hundred people in the pit and uh, all the technicians and all the dancers and like 400 people at the same time. And I'm in the middle of all this. I, I, I love that contrast. I want to play another piece of music. Take a listen to this. It's a little bit Terence Blanchard's opera, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. I got to talk to Terence in the middle of rehearsals for that show. Good. Wow. That's great. Yeah. He, he, he would leave the rehearsals and come out into the lobby of the Met. And he, we, we, he, we talk for about 20, 30 minutes, right? Lovely man. And um, Fantastic. Fantastic. What a privilege it was to collaborate on this. The first black composer to have a work performed by the Met. And, and you've said around Terence's opera that you are reassessing all of the operas that you want the Met to do. What stories do you now want the Met to tell? <laughs> well, it's quite simple. I think uh, for reasons that are not only specific to classical music, but classical music has been, unfortunately, part of this for um for the past two three centuries it's been white male telling their stories and um especially european and the met is an american <laughs> house which has its responsibility and still i take this seriously i am a custodian like everyone in the house of those great operas by Verdi and by Mozart and by Gounod and by Bizet and by Strauss and Wagner. But um, opera is about, like you said, telling stories. And, um, you know, I had this intention since I arrived at the Met to diversify our repertoire. And we invested right away in more new works to be, um, to be prepared and having uh, point of views from uh, African-American, uh, Latinx uh, community, uh, also native communities coming and more women on the podium, more women composing and writing the librettos. But then the pandemic happened and I just thought, okay, life's too short. That's good, but it, it needs to be now, not in five years, not in 10 years, not once a year. It needs to be more than this. And what really moves me and all of us is that this fire shut up in my bones, this masterpiece by Terence, uh, just filled the seats. Everybody wanted this. And, and there's this um, myth that, oh, people don't want new music. They only want what they're used to. And the, the audience in New York clearly sent us another message saying, look, no, this is what we need to hear. And that's why we are uh, recalibrating and it's of course a question of balance like anything else but we we're readdressing and, sh and shifting the balance uh, now that's such a powerful moment i mean because i don't have to tell you of all people this but like 
For years, I've been talking to people in in classical music in Canada and in New York, and just in my personal life, who have said like, yeah, Tom, you know, I might be able to get a piece commissioned and I might be able to get a contemporary Canadian piece performed once. He said, you know, I can get I can get a, a Brahms symphony played eight times a year or 30 times a year if I want by Canadian symphonies. I might be able to get a contemporary Canadian piece or a contemporary piece at all performed once ever. You know, and maybe this has been true for some time, but I think it's it's. It, it's both ways. I think there's a wave of change that's coming. Maybe people are even more ready for it. Or when I say people is, you know, there's, I believe that what we offer as classical music institutions, or let's call it maybe concert music institution, not so much classical anymore. Um, we are offering some things for people who really want to hear again their Vivaldi Four Seasons, and that's okay. One should not exclude the other. But there's also an audience, and, and generally, may I say, younger audience that wants to be challenged and wants to have something more closer to their, um, to what what is their everyday life or their aspirations. And I think there's a to diversify the offer is one thing, but also it needs to start by the institutions and the artistic and the music directors to change the narrative and i've been doing this in philadelphia steadily for the past 10 years because when i arrived in philadelphia the philadelphia orchestra was really not renowned for its groundbreaking um uh, revolutionary uh, revolutionary programming although if i look at the old history ancient history of the orchestra it, with Stokowski it was the first orchestra on film the first orchestra to record the first orchestra on tv uh, commissioning a lot of european composers and pieces that we now play and we like so why not doing the same in the 21st century and of course it's a responsibility i have and that i take more than happily and increasingly will take as the response uh, the person responsible for these two institutions plus orchestra metropolitan in montreal to do my my part to change the narrative and to share the stage with um, people who can tell their own story. I want to play another piece of music here. Evening, evening by Renee Fleming, the legendary soprano, and my guest, the Canadian director Yannick Nezet Seguin, is from the 2021 album Voices for Nature, the Anthropocene. Tell me, um, well, you know, the environment and climate and um, has been on our mind these days. And speaking of, I mean, that's the most that's the most broad thing I could possibly say in my life. By the way, it's been on our mind these days. But I mean, specifically here on Q, we've been. We've been talking a little bit about how artists are engaging with that with that part of our world. And um, I, I guess to your point about how classical music or concert music needs to still be contemporary, this is a great example of that. So talk to me a little bit about what you wanted to do with this with this record. Yeah, I think um, hmm, music and nature go hand in hand and they they have been for, you know, since the world, you know, the world exists, I believe, since there's human life. And even, you know, if you think of animal life, there's there's music everywhere. And um, this is probably an, one of the ideal channels to reconnect as human nature to uh, the harmony of the universe. And in such a moment where it's on our minds, I think that... Um, Orchestral music is also a great field for doing so because the variety of the orchestration uh, that's uh, on hand for any composers to tell the reality uh, in the face of what we have now, uh, what nature is telling us through music is really good. So I've commissioned a lot of pieces on that front, but the piano is my intimate side. It's the the side that I haven't been sharing so much with anyone uh, so far, at least just a little bit before the pandemic, where I did a tour with Joyce Di Donato and did this uh, uh, Winterreise, um, uh, the winter, 
journey, you know, by Schubert. And I decided in the pandemic to take more time at the piano because, you know, I, I, I could. And because that was really the way I could express musically. And then Rene Fleming called me and this idea just immediately uh, took shape. Uh, we didn't want something to be necessarily completely just one theme, but we wanted to explore how composers were in their own way preparing for this age that we're seeing now uh, arriving that we've been unfortunately maybe in denial uh, for so long. And that's why I'm, uh, well, not only am I really um, uh, moved by this project coming to completion now and being uh, out in the in the world, but also the fact that Rene, who has been recording for many decades and uh, is to me the absolute queen of song recital. Uh, for her, this project, she said that this Anthropocene is really this um, almost maybe the most significant project she's ever done because we commissioned uh, three composers to write for it and we also blended different uh, languages and genres. And I, uh, you know, it's our own contribution at the moment uh, for, for this. And um, maybe because it's only the two of us, it, it resonates even more uh, immediately for me. I want to play you one more piece of music. Do you know what that is? <laughs> so the storm from the Pastoral Symphony, but you know, I couldn't tell you from where it's coming. You know, like, is it a recording of me or, or not? I don't know. It is. The reason I wanted to play that for you is because, you know, your career has taken you all over the world. I mean, throughout this, this interview, you've been telling me stories about you know, traveling around the world and doing this tour there and, and now in New York and, and in Philadelphia. It's not lost on me that you're still in Montreal, you're still directing in Montreal. And I guess I wanted to ask, what does Montreal mean to you? Yeah. Well, I, I'm very, very, very proud of being from Montreal. I'm very proud to be from Quebec. I'm very proud to be from Canada. And I think that the circumstances of my own city has sh shaped the way uh, I am and who I am as a conductor and also the way I was encouraged and not discouraged to be a young conductor there, to have my own projects, to found my own group. And I feel that not only did I, I, um, I was lucky to have such great teachers at the Montreal Conservatory of Music and, uh, but really I feel, I feel, lucky to have this. And of course, Orchestre Metropolitain gave me a chance when I was a baby. When I was 24, I started at 25. In conductor years, that's a baby. So, you know, to, to trust me at that age to um, guide this orchestra, uh, it's really a question of gratitude for me. But now it's been 22 years. I could have left even by be, with being grateful to this, I could have left. But what I have developed with these musicians of Orchestre Metropolitain is um, it's kind of, it cannot be replaced because most of the repertoire that I'm conducting today, the Mahler symphonies, the Bruckner symphonies, the Ravel big pieces, it was my first time conducting them and their first time playing it. So I think that this is, it's kind of the first love. You can't replace the first love or something. And the good thing in conducting is that you can still stay attached to your first love while moving on. So um, I would have left the orchestra if I were, were not that um, fulfilled artistically and satisfied. The orchestra has grown so much. We did great uh, tours in Europe and Carnegie Hall in Chicago and... Uh, always to great success. So why leaving? You know, I just love my country and I just love my orchestra there. And it's, uh, uh, as I said, I think we make better music when we know each other. You're, you're like a band. Yeah, we're like a band. And I don't see any, any reason why to disband, you know? And that's why we, we signed this very unusual agreement for life. 
uh, two years ago. Uh, that's what we did. We for decided life? to stop thinking every five years. Oh, yeah, for life. I have a lifetime agreement with them because every five years, the musicians were nervous, say, oh, is Yeni going to leave? Oh, am I going to? And then we said, okay, let's just agree that we don't talk about this. We just stay. And, you know, at some point, if they want to kick me out, that's fine too. <laughs> but, you know, as long as they want of me, I, uh, I'm going to be there. So before we go, we've mentioned the Canadian audience. We've mentioned the North American audience. We've mentioned the modern audience. We've mentioned the classical audience. There's one audience we haven't mentioned, and that is the playlists we found that you create for your pets. <laughs> yeah. What is this all about? Well, <laughs> it was first a simple request for uh, from... Um, the Pennsylvania, uh, uh, the PSPCA, you know, from, of Pennsylvania. And um, they have a lot of animals there and they're, of course, sheltered there and they're uh, well waiting to be adopted. And they come very often from very traumatic um, backgrounds and experiences. So they felt like music could help them. And so I said, okay, I'm going to uh, help you by simply giving the music that I know that my pets, that my cats really love because I have three cats and they're very musical. And so uh, <laughs> whenever I'm away, I let I leave classical music all the time and I know they have their favorites. So that's how the playlist started. And it seemed to have, uh, had, to, to have had quite some success. <laughs> well, do me, a, do me a favor because uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what this... I don't think this is necessarily a compliment to the show, but uh, I've had friends tell me that they leave CBC Radio on Radio Canada on all day while their while their cats are home by themselves or their dogs are home. So, can you pick out a piece of music to play right now after this interview for the pets at home? Oh, uh, I would play a nice Chopin Nocturne. Any anyone in particular? Anyone? Oh, let's play the first one. The first one. And you know what? Cats, dogs, if you're listening, I hope this, hope this chills you out. I got to tell you, what a joy it, it is to talk to you. Thanks so much. It was a great, great, great time. Really great talking to you. Yannick Nezetz, again, is the Canadian conductor and the musical director of the Met Opera in New York.